Good evening. Thank you for reading for us, Josh. And as Julie said, we're continuing our series on being holy uh, and all things around holiness. And this week, we are thinking about holy money, particularly fitting for our gift day. We all come from different backgrounds and have very different attitudes to and amounts of money. Some of us may have lots, some of us may have very little, some of us may carry huge debt. So there's no one-size-fits-all approach for us this evening, although I think that there are some things that are relevant for all of us. And money isn't something that we talk about very often in church, well, we do on gift days, but in our British society, we don't talk about money. It's considered rude to talk about how much we earn or how much we spend, unless we particularly want to show off because we've spent a huge amount or found a bargain. <laughs> or how we budget. We just rarely talk about these things. But if we don't talk about money, how do we learn to navigate our way through our finances? We live in a world that tells us we are what we own. We're almost defined by our possessions. And very often, the more we have, the more we want. And the more we have, the more we will be accepted and liked by society. And we see this at Christmas time in particular. We're already being bombarded by adverts to buy things. Not just the things themselves, but the brand and the lifestyle that they promise. If you buy this perfume, you will be thin and beautiful and in a perfect relationship and wear sparkly dresses. If you buy this car, you will have no worries and journeys with your children will always be full of laughter. If we want to have holy money, how do we steer our way through this? When the Bible seems to say that the love of money is the root of all evil, when Jesus tells at least one person to go and sell all they have and give it to the poor, but we do actually have to buy food and clothes to live. Small houses come with huge rents or mortgages, and yet we're told not to worry about these things. And what does holy money even mean? Well, let's start there. Let's work out what holy money means. And then I've got three R's for us this evening. It's a good Bristol sermon. R's. <laughs> Reckless, response, and risky. Uh, and they're going to help us think through some of these questions. And a quick apology if you heard my midweek message this week. Some of this is going over the same ground, but it's important. So, sorry, not sorry. We've been thinking over the last few weeks what holiness means. And there have been all sorts of things that have been really helpful as we've grappled with this. But I loved Tom's quotation from Simon Ponsonby that he shared last week. The invitation to holiness is the greatest privilege offered to humanity. It is the making of us, the remaking of us in God's image. Holiness is about becoming more Jesus-like. Now, that doesn't happen overnight. It's ongoing. It's a lifelong process. It's part of our discipleship, our journey, our life with Jesus here and now. And it's invitation, not a command, an invitation to holiness. As God invites us to join in, he also enables us to respond through the Holy Spirit. He knows that we don't become holy by ourselves and that we need the Holy Spirit to help us. And the word holy literally means set apart. But that doesn't mean separate from. In fact, I think it means the opposite. If something's set apart, it's set apart for a purpose, not for its own sake. It's not set apart to be looked at and admired as something special or different. Being holy is about being set apart in order to bring glory to God, to work for his kingdom and to lift Jesus' name higher. It's to proclaim good news for the poor, freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour, all of which Jesus says of himself in Luke chapter 4. And to do that, we need to get stuck in and find the poor, the prisoners, the blind and the oppressed, not stay separate. That's what holiness looks like. But money can't do that. Money can't do either of these things, become like Jesus or find those in need because money isn't a living thing. But we can. Our attitudes to money, how we use it, can make it work for God's kingdom or not, depending on what we choose. It's not the money itself that's holy, it's us and our attitude, empowered 
and enabled by the Holy Spirit. What's our attitude to money? If someone from the outside were to look at how we spend our money, what would they learn about our priorities? One thing I suggest is that our money, however much we have or haven't got, is best used for God when we don't keep it for ourselves, when we are generous with it, when we don't try to accumulate, when we don't join in society's game of owning more and better and newer and faster. We can, of course, be generous with all sorts of things, with our time, our talents, our reputation, our attention, our energy, and those are really important, but those are different sermons. Tonight, we're thinking about holy money, and so about being generous with money. And as we think about being generous with money, let's take a step back and think about God's generosity, which brings us to our first R this evening, which is reckless. God's generosity is reckless generosity. It really is extraordinary generosity, extraordinarily reckless. Look at what Jesus did, for starters. His first miracle was turning water into wine at a wedding in Cana, the equivalent of about 700 bottles of wine for a wedding in a small village when they had already had quite a lot to drink, is reckless generosity. And what about the feeding of the 5,000? Not only was everyone fed, but 12 baskets of food were left over. Reckless generosity. And the ultimate act of generosity Jesus sacrificed his life so that we might be able to get to know God for ourselves. To know how much he loves us. And knowing that some of us might choose to reject that, he did it anyway. Reckless generosity. God so loved the world that he gave. As the first part of John 3 verse 16 says, God gives because he is so full of love. He can't help himself. He loves us so much that he gives of himself that we might know him for ourselves. We might have a relationship with him that we might live. And if you think about it, it's the same with us too. When we love someone, we give to them. Think of someone that you love or who loves you. I bet there's a whole load of giving going on there. At Christmas time, I find it so much easier to buy for those I know and love best than for those I just ought to buy for. When love is the motivation, giving is so much easier. God gives us everything. How many times in these testimonies, the what we love about giving testimonies, or in sermons over the last few weeks, have we heard this verse from 1 Chronicles 29, which starts by saying to God, everything comes from you. Everything. All that we are, all that we have, including our money, All things come from God. So God's generosity is reckless generosity. And what do we do in the face of this recklessness? We respond. Our second R. We don't live generous lives ourselves because of what I say. Quite interesting as I stand up here saying these things, but we don't do it because I say so or because anyone tells us to. We don't live generously because we ought to. We only live generously because we can't help it, because we're responding to God's extraordinary life-giving generosity and because we have been transformed by that love that first loved us. So this is a bit of an odd one as I'm standing here saying Don't do what I say, just respond. But now I'm saying, just respond, so should you or shouldn't you do that? (laughs) But what I'm saying is that I'm not going to tell you specifically how to respond, how much to spend on this or that, how much to give. But let's each remind ourselves of how generous God has been and is being to us, of all that we've been given, and let us each respond to that. And that will be different for each of us, Because as we said at the start, each of our situations is different. And God knows that. He knows our situations, our debts, what our obligations are. He knows what we need. And actually, this isn't about the money. How can I talk about money, not be about the money? (laughs) But what I mean is, our generosity isn't about the amount that we give, but about the motivation of our hearts. 
Remember that we can never pay God back. And as we heard in the video, we can never outgive God. And actually, I don't think he would want us to, even if we could. When we give gifts to people that we love, it's not in the expectation of anything in return. It's just because we love them. No other reason. That is our motivation. It's the same with God. He just loves us. He's given us so much, all that we have, all that we are, life itself. There's no way that we can give all of that back. But we can respond. And that's what God wants, a response from our hearts. There's a lovely phrase in the Quaker book of faith and practice, which says, attend to what love requires of you. And that's essentially what I'm trying to say here. We are loved. God is love. We love because God first loved us. Let's respond to that love. Let's attend to what love requires of us. And we can see a bit of this in our reading from Philippians. A brief bit of context. Paul is writing to the Philippians from prison. And they have sent Epaphroditus to help him. And if we look at verse 18, we can see that they have sent a gift to Paul with Epaphroditus. And the assumption is that this is a generous financial gift. Of course, Paul is grateful for the gift. But what he is more grateful for is what it shows of their heart. What it shows of their heart is pleasing to God. God is delighted with their motivation, with their love. And remember the story of the widow's mite in Mark chapter 12. Many wealthy people were putting lots of money into the collection box, and she put in only two small copper coins. It was all she had. But Jesus commended her because they, i.e. the rich people, all gave out of their wealth. But she, out of her poverty, put in everything, all she had to live on. God doesn't have a calculator to tot up the amount that we're giving. He looks at our heart. What would it look like for us if, like the widow in Mark 12, we gave all that we had to live on? Which brings us to our third R, which is risky. If we give money away, if we spend money on other things or other people, if we give stuff away, we don't have it anymore. Now, I know that sounds obvious, but we may have to go without what we want to enable others to have what they need. To enable the ministries of the church that we heard about in that clip earlier on. We may get laughed at because we have an older car or an older laptop or because we buy second-hand clothes. Or, what I find even worse, our children may get laughed at because they have a hand-me-down phone or because they can't go on all the school trips that are on offer. So we go without, or we might get laughed at. It's risky. Now, I'm not sure, and I'm fairly sure I haven't ever gone as far as giving all I have to live on. But it's still risky. But look at verse 19 from our reading from Philippians. And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. God will provide us with what we need. What a promise. Do we believe that? Do we really believe that? Do we trust him to provide all that we need? Not all that we want, but all that we need. Having said that, let's just be careful that that isn't our motiva motivation. If we give so that God will provide, and then all we're doing is giving so that we get, and that ends up with us accumulating for ourselves again. Instead, let us give recklessly, and let us trust God to provide what we need. There is a balance here again, isn't there? We need to be real about living in this world and real about trusting God. And either extreme is, is almost ridiculous. I leave it all to God. I never take out any insurance or go out to paid work at one end with, I will earn everything as much as I possibly can, hold onto it all myself so that I and my family are completely sorted forever at the other. And neither extreme really works. But I wonder which we need more of, more trust or more getting on with it ourselves. What would be the impact if we were to trust God for all that we need? What would it look like for us to work without a safety net or 
less of one. Or, or trusting God to catch us. In my experience, trusting God is both really exciting and really terrifying, <laughs> usually depending on how tired I am. But when a bill comes in or the car breaks down or whatever, the question is so often, right, Lord, how are you going to sort this one out? And it's quite exciting to see what he does. Somehow, he always does something. He always provides. But sometimes I just feel, oh, no, not again. Am I going to have to admit that I can't afford this or not join in? Or really, again, can't I just have it easy for a change? It's such a roller coaster, a roller coaster of trust. And sometimes I love it, and sometimes I really don't. But verse 12 has been a challenge for me on this. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. Paul knows what it is to have a lot, and he knows what it is to have very little. He is content in both situations, and we assume anything in between. It's easy when we don't have enough money to want more, to think that life would be better with more money. Now, some things may be simpler, but not everything by any means. And where does our trust lie if that's our mindset? I have sometimes been tempted. If I just got another job just a couple of days a week, then money would be a whole lot easier and life, quite frankly, less stressful and embarrassing. But then am I trying to solve things rather than doing what God has called me to and trusting him to take care of the rest? And if we have lots of money, it's easy to feel trapped, to feel stressed and responsible, to be anxious about having money when we're told not to love it, to worry about how to use it or whether it's going to get taken away from us. Sometimes the stress and responsibility can be crippling. And in neither of those situations is the freedom that God offers. And that's because mon money is occupying our minds consciously or subconsciously. It's become our goal and our purpose. So it's not wrong to have money or to be wealthy. Please don't hear me wrong. But it's not right for it to be our goal. Matthew 6, 33 says, Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. However much we have or don't have, our call is to put Jesus first, to build his kingdom here and now, however we can and wherever we are called to do that despite what society might tell us. And none of this is easy, which is why the very next verse, verse 13 says, I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Now, I've never really noticed the context of this verse before, but it's about coping in need and in plenty and saying that God will give us the strength to cope, the wisdom, the trust that we need to be content with either and we do this through him because that's the only way we can manage. Like Paul, we can learn to be content in both situations through God's grace. More grace, please, Lord Jesus. <laughs> but this contentment is a gift from him to us. Let's ask for that gift. In fact, it's all a gift. As we reminded ourselves earlier, everything comes from you. And that includes our contentment. And it includes our money which isn't actually our money, it's God's. The rest of that verse from Chronicles that we read earlier says, and we have given you only what comes from your hand. He's given it to us in the first place. It's up to us to give back to him however we can by responding to all that he's already done for and given to us. Do we see ourselves as trustees of what's given us? Or do we see ourselves as owner and controller of what we've earned. And so what does this look like in practice? How do we actually give to God when there are so many needs and demands on our money? As a start, I would encourage us to turn the question around. If all that we have really is God's, why don't we, rather than asking how much should we give, ask how much should we keep? If we really believe it's not ours, should we keep it? It's a huge mindset change. 
And like our holiness, it doesn't happen overnight. But it's just worth asking ourselves the question every now and then, how much should I keep? And seeing what happens. And if you share bank accounts or household income, of course, you need to work together and pray together about this, about how you respond to God together. And how do we give to God? Giving to God means giving to the church and giving to those who are in need. And I would encourage us to give to the work of the church if we don't already, and if we consider ourselves part of the church family here at St. Michael's, or to consider the possibility of increasing our giving if we already give. Now, I know circumstances change and that COVID has made things trickier financially for some of us, but let's ask God if he'd like us to increase our giving, even if only a little bit. And then if he says, yes, please, we need to trust him. That's the risky, or should we say exciting, bit. The church has no head office that provides funding. There's no central pot of money. All that we have as a church comes from all that we give as a church. And all that we give comes from God in the first place. The more we give, the more we can live to make a difference. The more we can learn and grow Share Jesus and serve together. This is what building the kingdom of God in Stoke Gifford looks like. And it's building the kingdom of God across the world. Some of the money given to us as a church, we give to others and support mission partners in different countries. Let's put our money to holy work. But please, don't give out of a sense of duty or out of guilt or because I say so. Respond to what God has done for you. God has given to us with a reckless generosity and he enables us to respond. It's the Holy Spirit that enables us to respond and to give it all because it is risky. Fun, but risky. Let's enable our money to become holy money as we use what God has entrusted to us to build his kingdom here. To seek his kingdom first. I'm going to hand over to Julie in just a moment. And as we close, I'm going to read this prayer of praise by St. Anselm. It's such a beautiful prayer of response to God, of all that he has done, and expresses that beautiful, holy spiral of God giving to us, giving to us and then enabling us to give back to him. The prayer of praise by St. Anselm. Lord, because you made me, I owe you the whole of my love. Because you redeemed me, I owe you the whole of my life. Because you have promised so much, I owe you my whole being. I owe you as much more love than myself as you are greater than I. For whom you gave yourself and to whom you promised yourself. I pray you, Lord, make me taste by love what I taste by knowledge. Let me know by love what I know by understanding. I owe you more than my whole self, but I have no more. And by myself, I cannot render the whole of it to you. Draw me to you, Lord, in the fullness of your love. I am wholly yours by creation. Make me all yours too in love.